What is your family's immigration story? I mean, unless you descend from Native Americans, your family immigrated here, but maybe the story is lost. And just knowing how they got here, that isn't it, right? Like, why did they leave? What hardships did they face? In this episode of Traverse Talks, you'll hear from Carlos Hill, Professor Emeritus at the University of Washington. He'll talk about digging into his family's past and writing about their immigration story. His book is called We Became Mexican American, How Our Immigrant Family Survived to Pursue the American Dream. For me, as a first-generation Korean-American, I was particularly taken by how you opened up the difficult relationship your mother had with her daughters as they were growing up in America. And so can you speak on how the cultural differences impacted their relationships? The idea is that uh, my folks coming from backcountry Mexico, from a traditional backcountry area, and there's a lot of traditional backcountry areas around the world, uh, they have their own moral codes. They have their own ways of giving value to certain behaviors. And so it's out of that very strong sense of morality that my mom in particular and my grandmother instilled in us as we were growing up in Southern California. And so that morality code conflicted with Anglo-American behaviors in Southern California. And so that created a lot of tension, especially for the girls, my sisters in the family. And so this tension, this uh, discrepancy between an older way of doing things and a newer way of doing things, that created a lot of tension and a lot of moments of abuse, yeah. you could really say. Well, from a modern-day perspective looking back. Yes, Tra- the, trauma. Trauma, fights, trauma, trauma. emotional, yeah. psychological. And, yeah. and in the field of Chicano literature, Mexican-American literature, I think I'm the only one who has addressed that. You know, I was wondering about that because... From a conservative rural background, and including my mother's, you don't talk about these things. You've given voice to realness of sadness and trauma that most families would shy away from. Well, I'll tell you one of the reasons, uh, in fact, the, the, the major reason that I included in the book, is because when I began interviewing my sisters, they said, don't you remember this? Okay. <sighs> and I'm just a boy. And boys get away with things. And then I was a boy who was into books and into libraries. So you could escape. And I got away from all that. Meanwhile, your sisters had to be with their mother all the time. They had to be with her mom, support her. And so I have some very um, heartfelt, heart-rending moments in the book with regard to my sisters. And if you read about Mary and Emily... It's kind of sad. Thank you for bringing that up. Because I I was taken aback by, you know, their population of America. What is it? I got here. 327 million people. And about 14% are immigrants. So we have 14% of American people completely experiencing a different day-to-day existence where you have old world ideals trying to merge in America, and their children are living in between. And you have experienced living in between. But even as a boy, there must have been some cultural shock and difficulties for you. I think so. There's so many different ways of reacting to this kind of situation. And on a very personal level, I think that one of the ways that I've reacted to my trying to fit in is that if somebody closes the door on me, I look for some other door. And so I'm never, almost never shut out. And there's a lot of people who don't look for the other doors. And then the other is that we all have bad moments, and I've had my bad moments, but I don't think much about them. They come to me and they go past me. A lot of people hold on to their bad moments. 
And so I think uh, I've said to myself many times, how do you explain what you've done and so on? And I think those are two kind of very key answers to what I've done, even in contrast with my own siblings. This book of your family history, it, it, it inspires me to want to dig into my own family history. Um, but was it difficult to talk about these things? You, you mentioned mm, ferreting out stories from your mother uh, because the culture difference. How did you even bring up the hard things with your mom? I think because she realized and that they were very that we had all gone through very hurtful moments. And so uh, there were a bunch of times in which uh, she she wouldn't uh, go forward in her explanation. And so I got information from my siblings on that topic. And then I came back to her. Well, and your mother, I mean, all relationships are complicated. And your mother left everything she knew. She was immersed in a completely different society, raising eight children. Exactly. And so she had pressures, and then there's not enough money. And Tremendous pressures, and then there was the death of her own mom, our grandma, and then the death of my own dad as well within a short period of time, and then the closure of our little micro-business, and then her having to go out to some ugly little factories to make money. I mean, this is awful. That's a lot to shoulder. And uh, And so the larger point is that Immigrant families, especially from traditional cultures coming to America, go through a lot. And that's, those are experiences that mainstream Americans hardly ever, ever think about. The title of your book, We Became Mexican-American, How Our Immigrant Family Survived to Pursue the American Dream. You chose the word survive. I did, yeah, very, Why? very deliberately, because uh, I think <laughs> many of us in our extended family are still chasing the American dream. And what is that? That's a very good question. <laughs> you, could you could describe it materially. You could describe it socially, psychologically, uh, intellectually. Uh, and so most people describe it materially in terms of money and finance. Uh, I think that's a common definition of the American dream. And so if you, if you define it that way, there's members of my family who are still pursuing the, the American dream. Mm. <laughs> my family is a big family. And they've instructed me in many ways, just by observing them, of what it is to come to America and settle down and um, and become a uh, a descendant of immigrant folks. So you're leaving behind something incredible for your descendants. I hope so. I hope so. I think so. And so, what would you like others to take away from this book? I think that for an individual, at one point in your life, when you get to midlife, I think, you begin to kind of uh, question who you are. And in asking yourself who you are, you have to inevitably ask where you come from and what got you to where you are. And so I think that's the, that's the biggest lesson that I can take out of this book. That for my grandkids, my great-grandkids, I have a bunch of great-grandkids. I hope that at one point in their lives, they'll come to, you know, to asking, what am I? What am I doing? Where do I really want to fit? Uh, what shall I tell my kids about who I am? I think those are questions that come to you in your 30s, 40s. Uh, and by the time you're in your 50s, uh, you want better answers. And so I think uh, I have a grandson who, who um, whose mother's background is um, Swedish. And so in some ways he's Swedish-Mexican, <laughs> Swedish-Mexican-American. <laughs> And so when he gets to his 40s, if he's uh, introspective and if he 
thinks about himself in ways that I'd like him to think about himself, he'll come to value what I've written. So, as a professor, you've had a career teaching people. And I have noticed, I follow some people of color on Twitter, and more and more people are saying, I'm tired of explaining my people's point of view to the majority Caucasian audience. We have, they, they feel they have taken the heavy load in explaining institutional racism and things like this. So as a teacher, and also as a person of color, how do you feel about that? My own take on that is that it, it depends on what your purpose is, I think, in the end. If you're a teacher of any kind, and if you're teaching an area that reflects your background, your cultural background, then you have no choice but to be uh, someone who explains that, you know, if your purpose is to make people of diverse backgrounds work well and satisfactorily within a society, then there's no other thing that you can do but explain. Uh, I'm 80 some years old. I've been doing that all my life, all my life. And even at this point, uh, I mean, I look back and I say, by God, what have I done all my life? I've tried to explain who Latinos are, where they come from, why they came and how they fit into American society. And there's no other way for me. But again, it depends on what your purpose is. What are you trying to do? I think that's the the, the answer to your question. Yeah, because I think a lot of um, uh, on the social media platforms, they are not professors of Chicano studies. Exactly. They're just everyday folk. Exactly. Who yeah. just point out so. and, and then they're like, you need to learn this on your own now. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so if if you see yourself, if you see yourself as a teacher, teach. I love it. So I grew up on the Tacoma side, and there's like what we call South Tacoma Way, but really the nickname is South Korean Way. And I remember being a little girl, and the first Korean groceries were being opened, and how excited my mother and her friends were to finally have their food easily available, (laughs) and uh, just the the vast array of different ingredients. So you grew up in the San Fernando Valley. Was it easy to get traditional foods for you? I grew up in the San Fernando Valley, and I grew up in a barrio, uh, which uh, can be translated as a sort of a California ghetto, although it's The word ghetto doesn't really quite fit. And so in the barrio, we had our own uh, butcher shops, our own pool halls, our own uh, drinking establishments, too many of them, our own churches, all that. And so it was a little Mexico. Mm. And in fact, it was referred to by people on the outside as a little Mexico in San Fernando. And so, yeah, and so we were born into that barrio. Uh, and one of the points that I make in my talk is that, so my parents, being immigrants, are the, I call them the first generation. So they come into the barrio, and in many ways it protects them. It allows them to survive and to keep on going. Well, the second generation, my siblings and I, we couldn't wait to get away from the barrio. Okay. And the third generation, far away from the barrio. And the fourth generation doesn't even think about the barrio. The assimilation has its phases to it, and, uh, and different families uh, do different things. Yeah. What are your thoughts on assimilation? Is it a complete loss of your cultural background? Uh, eventually. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I think is the I think is the right word. So we're at, we're at our fourth generation. I have to respect what younger people how younger people even in my family view their own ethnicity because I don't understand it totally. I understand my view of my own ethnicity, but I don't understand their view of their own ethnicity. And I have to respect that right for them to view their ethnicity in their own way. Interesting. Yeah. And so 
uh, I know that my, uh, my descendants down the line, they see themselves as being Latinos or Mexican-Americans or so, in their own way. And I don't fully comprehend it. Uh, but I do know that I have to respect that because only they can define it their own way when the moment comes that they want to define it. You're giving so much permission to be yourself. Exactly. This is not what your mother would have done. Uh, No. They wanted us to be tried and true Mexicans. So why let go of that? Well, uh, in part because um, assimilation is a terribly powerful force. And in my view, um, you can't. You can't overcome it. But it takes generations for it to work itself through. Have you ever thought about the ancient people, like the Silk Road and whatnot? We've been mixing and changing. One of the best examples that I have about assimilation is that, uh, not going all the way back to the times of the Silk Road, uh, but you're right, uh, but... A very good example for us Latinos to understand, especially Latinos of uh, Mexican background, is that one of the first major experiences of assimilation uh, that had an importance to it was the assimilation that occurred after the Spanish arrived in Mexico. And so they arrive, and they, to say it very blithely, they merged into Indian society, okay? Yeah. And so out of that merging comes the mestizo people, the blended people. And the cultural interaction is a new product. So we've had assimilation going for 500 years. So here we are in the 21st century, and we're worrying about assimilation into Anglo-American society. It's just part of a larger pattern that's been going on for a long time. We worry too much, perhaps. I think some of my colleagues, especially my Latino colleagues, uh, worry about that. Some of them say, Carlos, uh, what are we going to do about assimilation? You know, what are we going to do about uh, white supremacy, you know? And, uh, you know, I, I say to myself, gosh, you know, we've been wrestling with these things for, for a long time, you know? And, and the Caucasian Americans are worried about assimilation, too. <laughs> <laughs> the reverse. <laughs> I just think everybody just needs to do it because the food gets better. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Tastier food. <laughs> right, right. Oh, thank you, Professor. I could probably ask you right. more questions, but I know you have to get going. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Carlos Heal, Professor Emeritus at the University of Washington. Read his book, We Became Mexican American, How Our Immigrant Families Survived to Pursue the American Dream. And how about looking into your family's history and writing about it? Your descendants will thank you. For Traverse Talks, I'm Sue Ann Ramella. <laughs>